Oh, that was really low. <laughs> Let's, you know how this game goes. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Very good, very good. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're excited about today's presentation. My name is Trinita Bethea, and I'm the Housing Administrator here at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. And on behalf of our Executive Director, Dwight Farmer, he's in the back. Dwight, wave it, everyone. Thank you. On behalf of um, Dwight Farmer, our Executive Director, and Randy Keaton, our Deputy Executive Director, we welcome you here to the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission Regional Building. Again, we're very excited about today's presentation. Um, whenever we have the opportunity to look futuristically, we've kind of been stuck where we have for a while. We know what the market has looked like. We know the detriment that our communities have suffered based on the market. So it's always hopeful to see a little bit of information that we can start using as planning tools, as ways to get our communities back on track. So we're very excited to have some great speakers today with a lot of information that will be very helpful to you at your organization and locality. Um, Housing Virginia has done a phenomenal job with really giving us a lot of tools and a lot of techniques that we can use. So if you have not visited their website, I'm sure Bob will, will give Housing Virginia a plug. Please visit Housing Virginia's website. There are a lot of great tools and predictors on their website that will really help you with grant writing, with making the case in your own communities about why affordable housing is so much needed as a vital asset to our communities. We want to go ahead and welcome Bob. I know that we have a lot of information to go over today. We want to make sure that we have enough time for you to soak in all the information as well as um, give us a little bit of time to talk and chat and have questions and answers if there are some other issues that you see in your communities that need to be addressed or if you need some type of information as it relates to some of the, um, the data that you will see today. Our first speaker with Housing Virginia has a wide diverse expertise in both housing finance and public policy. He is the president of Housing and Development Advisors, which he founded in 2006. The organization provides a range of consulting services, financial structuring for housing and commercial development, community revitalization planning for downtowns and neighborhoods, public policy development for affordable housing and community development. His clientele includes nonprofit, for-profit, and public sector organizations. Bob previously served as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Community Housing Partners for nearly a decade. During his tenure, CHPC significantly expanded its multifamily development activity and created NeighborWorks Home Ownership Center for serving Hampton Roads. His resume includes leadership positions at the low, National Low Income Housing Coalition, the Virginia Development of Housing and Community Development, Virginia Housing Development Authority, and Bob also serves on a variety of national and local boards and advisory committees, including the Advisory Council of the Federal Home Loan Bank. As you can see, Bob serves a lot of different organizations and he wears a lot of, of hats and he's also always a great asset to us here at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. Please help me welcome our first speaker, Bob Adams. Thank you, Trinita. Um, and thanks, thank you all for coming this morning and giving two hours of your um, busy day to talking about the importance of housing in this region. Uh, let me just say a word about Housing Virginia. As Shania said, I, I do a number of things. One of my favorite things that I do is to provide staff support services to Housing Virginia. Um, Housing Virginia is kind of a unique organization. It's been around for, uh, for about seven years. And what is unusual about it is uh, Housing Virginia was the place where all of the sectors of the housing industry came together, so around the same table. And so that includes a pretty diverse uh, set of, of players, including um, for -profit, the for-profit development community, realtors, lenders, localities, nonprofit housing providers, homeless providers, fair housing organizations, uh, banks, mortgage companies, uh, the whole range of players that are involved in 
affordable housing across Virginia. And they, they don't always agree on everything, not surprisingly. But they decided to come together and see what could they agree on and what could they work together on. And that was uh, really a simple mission, which is to advance understanding, awareness, um, and, ex and uh, create expanded opportunities for affordable housing in communities all over the state. So Housing Virginia does that in, in a variety of ways. Um, one of them is to work with great regional partners like the Hampton Roads Housing Consortium. Uh, we work with uh, Janita, who's a, um, a very able and um, active uh, facilitator of that group and staffer of that group. Uh, we work with about 10 regional housing coalitions around the state uh, to get information out um, to provide the kinds of tools that Trinity was talking about. That's the second thing we do, which is we're really the, the best, most comprehensive, accurate, up-to-date source of information about what's going on with affordable housing in your community that exists in the state. We do that through our website, Shunita mentioned it, uh, www.housingvirginia.org. Please go there. There's a vast amount of data there. It's a little bit, I warn people, it's a little bit like uh, trying to take a sip out of a fire hydrant. So I would urge you to sort of dip in there and uh, start slowly at, because uh, you can find a whole lot of information. It's very deep. And uh, actually next year we're going to be reorganizing the site a little bit to make it even more user friendly. We've added so much information over the last couple of years that it's pretty dense right now. But there's very cool tools that you can uh, look at. Uh, there's an, uh, um, there's a, a tool that you can use where you can look at uh, a whole range of uh, employment classifications and the salaries of those employment ca classifications and see how affordable housing is to an elementary school teacher in Norfolk, to a retail clerk in Suffolk, uh, to a childcare worker in Virginia Beach. Um, we've just added a tool that shows you for any given income level, what's the maximum rent that a, that a household can afford? What's the maximum home that that person can afford? By the time we all get together here in, or over in Norfolk, uh, at the end of November for the Governor's Housing Conference, we're going to have added an economic impact calculator to uh, Sourcebook, which is one of the tools on, on the Housing Virginia website. And that will allow you to put into, the, uh, put into that tool, uh, we're going to build um, 32 apartments uh, averaging 850 square feet, and it'll tell you what's the economic impact on the community, how many short-term jobs are created, how many long-term jobs are created, what's the economic spinoff, what's the increased amount of taxes that will be paid to the locality uh, and to the state. So it's a tool that you can use in talking with public officials about the fact that affordable housing isn't just a good thing to do because every family in the state needs a decent place uh, to raise their kids uh, and to have um, a stable environment. Uh, but ho housing and affordable housing is also good economic development for a region. I'm going to touch on that a little bit today. So the third thing that Housing Virginia does is uh, every year we do, a, we do a policy project and we use that policy project to go around the state and do exactly what I'm doing today, which is to talk to groups of people who believe that affordable housing is important in your community um, and to get a dialogue going ar around a whole range of issues. So uh, a couple of years ago we, we uh, did a study, in fact I, we delivered it in this very room, uh, uh, talking about housing and uh, jobs, connecting transportation and, um, and housing. Uh, last year we did, a, um, we did a project that focused on the economic impact of housing in local communities. This year our project is called Housing 2020. And Housing 2020 is quite different in that it, is, uh, it asks you to step back from uh, everything that we have been focused on with respect to the housing market over the past few years. So we've been in, um, we've been in a bit of a crisis in terms of 
our housing market. You all know that. Uh, this is, um, this, uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with a report called State of the Nation's Housing that's put out by the Joint Center for Housing Studies up at Harvard. It comes out every year and it's sort of the national snapshot about what's going on uh, in housing and especially in affordable housing across the country. So in 2009, we were really at the depth of uh, the, the very bottom of this housing crash, um, actual housing depression that we've experienced. So the language was, was uh, pretty over the top. We were, we were having financial institutions with massive write downs, losses of housing and stock wealth, consumer confidence was plunging, households were cutting their spending. I mean, it, we were really in dire, dire circumstances. Um, and, and we sort of know all of those bad uh, pieces of information. The foreclosures that occurred across the state. We've had well over 100,000 uh, families lose their homes in Virginia over the last five years. The construction of new homes in Virginia almost came to a complete stop at the, at the bottom of this housing recession. Um, really record lows and sales of existing homes as well as consumers really were afraid uh, of that became very afraid of the housing market with falling prices weren't something that had been uh, really the gold standard what was happening in housing for the last 30 years in this country which was prices continued to go up and up and up that all changed um, so sales of existing homes went uh, went down to record uh, lows. And also, we still have over 20% of the mortgaged homes in Virginia are underwater, meaning they are worth less than the amount that, that is owed on them. So we still have a tremendous uh, problem with respect, even though values are coming back, and you're going to hear about that, and, and there, there's certainly good news over the last year in terms of what's happening with the housing market. But we're not out of, by any means, out of this very deep hole uh, that, we, uh, that we've been in for the last five years. And, and very significantly, the home ownership rate, which had been climbing in this country and in Virginia ever since it was, ever since that was being tracked, began to decline. Declined for the first time, I think, in 2010 or 2011, and has been declining ever since, and is still continuing to decline. So, uh, those, so those are big changes uh, that, that happened. And you know, here we were t three years later, 2012, uh, in the state of the nation's housing, saying, well, this could be the start of a real housing recovery. And we have seen something of a housing recovery, although Robert Schiller, who's kind of the housing guru early this year, he says, uh, tea leaves don't clearly suggest any particular path for prices uh, either up or down. Now, now, I think he was a little bit wrong there because we've now had nine months of pretty steady movement of prices going up. But that's a pretty complicated picture. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And I think it's still true that we're not sure in the medium to long term what's, um, what's, what's going to happen with prices. So all of that is uh, kind of a prelude to what I really want to talk about, which is I don't want to talk about any of that. Um, we talk about that constantly. That's really how, how we talk about housing in Virginia and in the country right now is focusing always on the crash, the depression, what's happened with the housing industry, what's happened with our home building industry, uh, the loss of uh, capacity in home building, the number of realtors who've, who are no longer in that business, um, all of that crisis. It's good for us to be aware of that, to focus on that. We do want to continue to track, all right, what's going on with home sales? Are they continuing to go up? Are prices continuing to go up? But very importantly, there are some other things going on in the background that are um, going to result in very significant changes in the way housing is done in this country and done in Virginia and done in our local communities. And if we miss that story, I think we're missing a much bigger story. Uh, and it's very important for us to understand those kind of seismic shifts that are happening uh, because we need to make sure that our industry is prepared for those, for those changes and that our communities are prepared for those changes. So the whole purpose of this presentation is to get you to step back from the 
urgency of the current market and to think big. Think about the long-term future and what's going to be affecting housing um, over, the next dec over the next decade. So we do that in this presentation. I'm not going to do this whole presentation today. But we looked at it in four areas, demographics, economics, finance, and green and sustainable. These four areas, uh, there are major shifts underway. The one I'm going to talk about today is demographics. It's, in some ways, it's the most, I, I, I would say this, of these four areas, two of them, the train has left the station and is rolling down the tracks. And there's no changing it. That's demographics and green and sustainable. The other two, economics and finance, those are, those are to some extent, moving targets. You've all heard about what's going on in Washington with respect to changes in the way we finance housing in this country. It's not entirely clear how that's all going to play out. We'll certainly know that within another year or so. And economics, of course, uh, we, um, we, when we first did this presentation, we worked with a, a, an economist, um, and she gave us some projections for what was going to happen with Virginia's economy. But economists don't want to look too far out. So um, this, these are things that we're going to also update within another year. But demographics, there's no changing that. Those, those are baked in the cake right now. So we need to understand uh, what those are, how they're going to reshape our housing markets uh, moving forward. So uh, main points I want to talk about today are population which is growing in Virginia. We're in a very good position. We're in a pretty healthy state uh, from an economic point of view and from a population growth point of view. But that's, um, there's huge regional variation in the state. I want to talk briefly about that. Household growth. It's, it's, of course, not population growth, per se, that drives the housing market. It's household growth. Households, households are the economic unit that consume housing. Households rent apartments and households buy homes. So we want to look at what's happening with household growth and even more importantly, who those new households are in Virginia. Because they're, they're pretty different than the households that we've seen uh, in the state over the last uh, 20 years. The millennials and the baby boomers. The, um, the, those, the baby boomers, my generation, uh, uh, and, and we've got Fortunately, both groups represented here today in the room. Uh, you're not at odds with each other. In fact, you'll find out that you have a lot of similarities. So these two groups, though, of course, are the, the dominant demographic groups in the country. There's a little generation in the middle, uh, the Gen Xers, the kind of left behind. No one cares about the Gen Xers. The, re the retail retailers don't care. The housing market doesn't care. But. Um, <coughs> The thing about the millennials and the, and the boomers is both are uh, going to continue to dominate the housing market in the next 20 years. Boomers because they're retiring, they're ch potentially changing housing status, and millennials because they're entering the housing market in a big way right now. Um, and then finally, housing preferences uh, we're seeing are really changing but for both of these, of these really dominant groups. So the, the way we... Uh, constructed this presentation was for each of these four areas, we worked with an issue area expert. For demographics, it's a guy named John Martin, who's a demographer. He works up in Richmond. He um, lectures all over the country. And he works a lot with uh, businesses that are trying to understand the consumer preferences of their customers uh, going forward. So what you're going to see a little bit today is some uh, some summary information on this subject that I'll talk about, and then you're going to see a couple of clips from John talking about this topic. So uh, for population growth, the, you know, the questions are how much, where will it be, who are those, who are those people being added to the population, and, and what does that mean for housing? So uh, here's, here's a clip from John putting that in perspective. Well, from the grandest perspective, looking at population, you, you think about are we growing, or are we attracting? And the good news for America is that we're growing. And demographers tend to look out. We're all going years. to need so to be very I'm quiet. Talk about between now and we'll see if we can get this increased. So, uh, 
Uh, when you look at America, we're at 307 million Americans. And we are projected to grow based on past growth patterns. We're projected to grow to about 360 million Americans over the next 20 years to 2030. Um, we are going to figure out uh, the best way to manage this growth as a nation, but also as a commonwealth, because Virginia is slated to grow. In fact, we're going to grow about the same rate as the country overall. Over the next 20 years, we're going to increase our population by about 22%. So we're going to grow from 8 million today to about 9.8 million. So about 2 million more people are going to be living in Virginia by 2030. And that's based on historical growth patterns in the past, as well as sort of the movement to the coast. We've seen over the last 100 years in the census, more and more of the coast are uh, receiving population gains, as well as urban areas. And Virginia is right there with a lot of urban areas defining who we are. In fact, there's a, a phenomena or a uh, geographic classification that was created years ago, two decades ago, called the Golden Crescent. And demographers were looking at these long, long-term trends, and they said that uh, a lot of the population corridors are going to grow so much, they're going to ultimately connect to one another. I think probably a great example is Los Angeles. You think about that as a megatropolis. It is just, they're just, it seems like it goes on and on forever if you, if you find yourself out there. The same thing is happening right now in Virginia. The Golden Crescent runs from Baltimore through Washington, Northern Virginia, down through Fredericksburg, Richmond, and then over to Hampton Roads. So picture this, this moon-shaped crescent, if you will, where we're right at the elbow in Richmond where we're talking today. But this crescent is really filling in today. And if you look out over the next 20 years, it's going to take the vast majority of Virginia's population gains. In fact, we're projecting about 80% of Virginia's population growth, that 1.8 million, 2 million new people, 80% of that population is going to locate in our crescent. So, so um, yeah, so John goes on to talk a little bit more about uh, some, some details on that. I'm going to actually s skip through um, a to sort of stay on time, I'm going to skip through a couple of his presentations as we go through here. But this is not news to any of you. You know where growth is happening in Virginia. It's um, the top is uh, the, this is from um, uh, Weldon Cooper Center up at UVA. The, the top map is population in 2010. Down here is projected in 2030. They changed the classifications a little bit, but the you know the gist of it is that this corridor from 95, from Washington 95 down to Richmond, 64 to Hampton Roads. That's where over 80% of our growth is going to happen in the state. And frankly, if you look at the other areas outside of that corridor that are going to grow, like uh, the Charlottesville area, uh, Brown Oak, New River Valley, uh, Lynchburg area to some extent, uh, you pretty much eat up all the growth uh, that's, that's available in the state. So that's... Um, I guess uh, interesting news, maybe bad news for rural areas that are going to continue to lose population um, and need to, uh, need to develop strategies to address that. The opposite is true for areas where all this new growth is coming. Uh, we need to develop good strategies to, to accommodate that growth and understand what that growth means for the housing market and especially who that growth is and what they're going to be demanding in terms of housing. So um, I'm actually going to go through, skip through John talking about, um, that's sort of more background on, on uh, population growth. Let me talk for a minute about, um, about me, about baby boomers, and um, where we are in the housing market right now and why that's important. So you've heard a lot about the age wave and that's really the movement of the baby boom, uh, the largest population cohort we've had until the millennials, which is larger. Um, as it's moved through um, over the last 40 years, as it's moved through uh, the various age classifications. So back in the 60s, it was uh, teenagers in early 20s. and. Uh, by, the, by the 1980s, it was people in their middle age, and now here we are, 2000 to 2020, and it's the 55 and over 
age groups that are seeing all this uh, high growth. And that's really my population demographic, my colleagues, my, my friends. Um, we're all reaching the point where we are, we have age 65 or 66 in sight. Uh, whether that means retirement or not remains to be seen. But um, baby boomers are approaching this point of transition. And that's a really important thing for communities to be aware of. Virginia is very, uh, has been very active and has done a really great job of working with communities to understand what it means to be age wave ready. I think these are, these are two ads that are done by, uh, by the Virginia Department for the Aging. And uh, they've been out around the state for many years now talking about what it means to be an age wave ready community. Um, and what age wave ready housing looks like. Well, I think this age shift, the age wave, has profound implications for communities, uh, rural and, and uh, suburban and urban communities. Think about uh, the way we take care of our current seniors. Um, a lot of it is around group homes and around nursing homes. Today's seniors really learned about uh, the longevity bonus of living to be 80 years old, kind of at the end of their life. But boomers taking care of their parents are noticing this and going, oh my gosh, I'm going to live to be 85 or 90. So they're getting the longevity bonus kind of early in their life. When they're 50 and 60, they're seeing this. And so when, through our research, we're realizing that boomers are rejecting that model of saying, let me go off and live in a nursing home. Let me go off and live in a, in a group home. And they're taking stock in where they live now, many of them experiencing that empty nest syndrome where their kids now are off at college and are saying, you know, I, I want to remain vital. I want to remain part of my community. So there's a term that, that a lot of people have uh, used called aging in place. And so boomers don't want to go off and age in a group home or nursing home. They want to age in their own home or age in place. So the implication this has on communities is that we need a new model for housing. It's not the suburban model where you're going to have uh, boomers sort of trapped behind the geraniums as the reality of trying to drive when they're older hits in. So what we're seeing already is sort of a flight to uh, walkable communities. You know, 15-minute communities is a great term where you can live and have an encore career or a part-time job in retirement and go get all of your staples, your food, and all of your health care, all within 15 minutes. So, uh, so this is one of the things that, uh, that, that John preaches around the country all the time is what, uh, what are the choices boomers are making as they approach retirement? Well, one, one of those is that they're not retiring. <laughs> they're not retiring. That's one choice. They're, they're uh, actually delaying retirement. And some of that is economic. Just came out of a very, very deep recession. You all know what happened uh, to uh, 401ks. Uh, John's phrase is 401ks became 201ks. So uh, that, that pushed uh, some people's timelines for retirement back. Also, uh, boomers don't think about retirement in the same way that, for example, my parents' generation did. Uh, they don't see themselves stopping work and moving to uh, Arizona or to Florida or, uh, or to a, a golf course and playing golf. Now, some do. This is not a light switch on off. But as a group, boomers talk a lot more about if they retire, they'll start a new business or they'll start a different career and they'll keep working. Um, uh, again, one of John's phrases later is uh, that boomers um, live to work. Uh, millennials work to live. That's a significant difference between those two generations. So um, what does this mean for, for housing? Well, as John said, there's really two choices I think that boomers are going to be looking at. One is, number one is trying to stay where they are, aging in place. And that doesn't necessarily mean in the house they're in. Um, but it means in the community that they're in. Uh, they want to stay connected to the communities that they've been involved with. And they are also looking for communities where they will have access to um, educational resources, to cultural resources, to retail, to shopping, um, and, and potentially even in a walkable um, 
you know, in a walkable form. So from housing, of course, what are the most important things that we hear from uh, boomers? Well, actually, number one is affordability, because what happens when you retire, your income goes down. Unless you happen to be a very lucky person in the 1% or, or top 10%, generally, your income goes significantly down when you retire. So housing affordability becomes much more important to you. Boomers have actually been profligate spenders. That's why retailers and our consumer-driven uh, economy has done so well in the last 30 years, because boomers are big, big spenders. Um, that is likely to change now as boomers enter retirement. So affordability is really important. <clears throat> of course, accessibility. Um, I think, uh, which has always been true, <clears throat> as people age, they begin to have more and more impairments. So they're looking for housing that is going to be able to accommodate that. Uh, housing that is, uh, doesn't require a lot of repairs and maintenance. That's typical. But smaller and greener are things that we hear from boomers. Accessory unit friendly uh, apartments are not, uh, units, not only that we hear from boomers, but from their kids who are anticipating, well, maybe mom or dad will need to come and live with me at some point. A lot of frowns in the audience <laughs> when I said that. Um, so, uh, but it could happen. Um, and aging in place, and then of course rental, uh, as people retire, they become certainly more open to the idea of renting than, uh, um, than necessarily remaining a homeowner. What does it mean for communities, though, for broader than just the housing unit that you live in? Well, of course, first of all, safety, and that's always very high on the list when you talk to people who are um, seniors or aging. But walkable, access to public transportation, mixed-use neighborhoods, access to retail and dining, cultural, recreational, educational. These are, um, these are things that are really different for boomers. Um, and that is why, as John said, there's a real desire to stay connected to the communities they're in. And I think boomers are also realistic about that looking forward, um, they know in 10, 15, 20 years, they're not going to be driving everywhere. So they are anticipating that and thinking about what is that, what is that, what's the community need to look like for me to be able to continue to live this way, but not necessarily get in the car every day uh, and, and um, get done what I need to get done by car. So I, I think the, um, you know, the basic message here is that um, there's, no, there's not uniformity uh, uh, within the boomer population as there is within any generation. Uh, there's a lot of diversity, and there are going to be pretty diverse choices. But these kinds of broad trends that I've been talking about are, are, are I think, clear, um, and, and we're definitely moving in that direction. So um, let's talk a minute about what's different about households uh, that are being uh, created in Virginia right now. Yeah, well, another huge shift that's happening in America and across our Commonwealth as well is the, the shift in household makeup. And uh, a lot of people, I think, especially people 50 and older, when we think about what does the quintessential American household look like, the nuclear family, we see mom and dad and, and two kids. And uh, I'm certain that that model has been blown up a long time ago. When we look at population growth and the makeup of America today, we see a different nuclear family. Uh, we see a lot of shifting in the atoms that have taken place. So uh, I can give you a couple of, of, of big examples. One is uh, when you look at head of household, uh, you traditionally would think about a two-headed household. Now a third of all households are headed by a single person. And it may be that they've lost someone, or it may be that they chose never to have someone. But a single head of household representing a third of our society is huge. Uh, and when you look deeper on who are these people that are heading up these single households, uh, it predominantly is women. And this has profound implications. If the household, uh, if there's a single head of households really headed by, by women, and if most households, the primary breadwinner is headed up by a female, then you have to think about the decision makers and what's going on inside the household. And I can tell you from a lot of the research that we do for financial institutions that, that want to help uh, people plan for the future, uh, they are trying to retrain people, mortgage uh, <coughs> brokers and investors, 
to stop looking at just the man in the conversation, that you need to spend at least half your time, if not more, focused on the female. But it has implications in terms of the decision on where people are going to live uh, and, and how we're going to market to them and what kind of products we're going to offer, that the female uh, preferences are taking on a much more dramatic and profound impact on decisions. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's not news. Uh, Newsflash there, women are making big decisions in households. That's certainly been true in my household for many, many years. So, uh, but it's, uh, it's that, is a, that is a trend that is continuing to grow. And obviously, um, housing providers see it, um, lenders see it, retailers see it. Um, and, uh, but it's not just uh, female-headed households that are, that are changing the appearance of our, um, of our population, of our households. Uh, there's other things going on, one of which is multi-generational households. This, this is uh, um, uh, the oblivious baby boomers who are uh, retiring or about to retire and their, their poor uh, offspring who's living in the basement. Um, multi that's, a, that's kind of a a little bit of a cliche of a multi-generational household, but um, increasingly true in the last three or four years. Uh, but there's all other kinds of multi-generational households that are out there right now. This is just, this is a map showing you the incidence of, of those households nationally, and you can see Virginia already has a significant incidence of, of uh, multi-generational households. And this just shows you the kind of the long-term trend from 1940 when a quarter of our population lived in multi-generational households, that declined and declined and declined until it reached the low point in 1970. Uh, but it's been, it's been going up ever since. So we're on a 40-year upward trend here. That's a pretty strong indicator of, of where things are going. We're, we're now only up at 16.1% of the population living in multi-generational households as compared to a quarter of it back here. But of course, the country has grown dramatically, so we have a lot more people living in multi-generational households right now. And it's great diversity. I grew up watching the Waltons. Uh, that was a baby boomer uh, reference for you. Uh, and so that was kind of my concept of this multi-generational household of, in rural America with, with you know, four generations in the, in living under the same roof. But today, it's very, very different. And one of the things that is uh, driving that is um, Virginia is a high immigrant state. And immigrant families have a much higher incidence of multi-generational um, uh, families, uh, households living in the same house. And so, of course, Virginia has a very high and growing uh, Latino population, also Asian population, and both of these, both of these subgroups have a, have a much higher incidence of, of, um, of multi-generational. Uh, and that has implications for the, for the housing stock, of course, for what kind of housing you need to provide to house that kind of, um, that kind of family. Th this is just looking at a couple different measures of what's been going on with household formation in this country. Uh, household formation during the Great Recession declined dramatically. And that's not a huge surprise, of course. During times of economic uncertainty, people are much less inclined to strike out and form uh, their own household and get an apartment and um, uh, just don't have the, uh, either the confidence in the economy or don't have the income to do that. So we've had a, a real drop in household formation as a result of the economic conditions that we went through. But there's other things going on too. Unemployment for millennials is still very high, uh, twice the national average. Real wages for younger people um, have actually declined since 2007 and they've been flat for the, the whole population for quite a while. This is, a, this is shocking, but we can maybe have people raise their hand. No, I won't make you do that. Uh, one in three uh, people between, young people between the age of 18 and 25 report moving back into their parents' home as a result of uh, economic conditions. Uh, and then this is one that we don't think about very often. Um, house and apartment sharing are, are at record high levels, and we don't have a really good way of tracking this. It's, it's largely anecdotal, but 
I track it anecdotally with my kids. Uh, I have three kids who now all live in the Washington area. When they moved up there, the first thing they did was to go to Craigslist and see if they could find an apartment to share or a house to share. That is really the way that young people think about getting into the housing market when they move into a high cost area. They can't afford to go rent an apartment for $1,800 in, uh, in the Washington metro area right now. So they share houses, they share apartments, and in doing that, they are not forming households. So this is, um, this is a kind of another really long-term trend line. The center point is sort of the, the average rate of household formation in the US, and then that red line is what's actually happened. And so you can see beginning in, uh, when the recession hit, household formation started to decline, and it, has, um, it is starting to recover now, but we're, we're well below the trend line. Um, and this is, you know, it's not exclusively young households that form, young uh, people that form households, but that's a big part of household formation. This is looking at uh, Florida, couldn't find this data for Virginia, but it's the rate of household formation for Floridians between the ages of 25 and 34 starting in 2005, and you can see it's just a steady stair step down the rate at which they're forming households. Um, there's also um, long-term trends operating in terms of household composition, and, and again, this is not news to any of you. Married households are declining, never married are growing, separated and divorced are growing. This is, this is just another way of looking at that same data. And then um, uh, the top line are two married parents with children, and you can see from 1960, when it was almost 90%, to 2008 where it's less than two thirds now. Um, and conversely, this line right here, which is single parent households, that's been growing and that is, a, is of course also a, um, you know, a long term trend. So let, let's, um, let's shift and talk just a little bit about the millennials and how they are going to impact uh, the market. On the other end of the generational scale uh, are the millennials often called Gen Ys. So I'm gonna use Gen Y as the term for them. Uh, this, is the, this is the youngest generation, aged 10 to about 30. And so every community is blessed with these young folks. In fact, some communities are even embarking on ambitious marketing campaigns to try to attract these folks because they realize they need them in their workforce long, long term. Understanding Gen Ys and what they want is just as important as understanding baby boomers and where they're headed into retirement and their implications on, on communities. This group was influenced so much by hyper-parenting, helicopter parenting, and by technology, the ubiquitous nature of technology where they are hyper-connected literally 24-7. In fact, in some of their research, I think 85% of Gen Y sleep with their cell phones, right? All right, that's... John can be a little critical of millennials. Um, so, but uh, here's an interesting um, factoid. When I, when I was um, 18, in 1968, um, if a survey of my age group uh, in terms of our most desired possessions, what would you imagine was number one? A car, of course. Yes, an automobile. Same um, survey of 18-year-olds today. What is number one? Smartphone. Yes, smartphone. Cars, third on the list. So there is a um, definitely a shift, and, and in fact, um, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but if 19-year-olds um, if, uh, in 1990, um, about 80% had their driver's license. Um, today, that number is about, um, it's less than two-thirds, I think it's around 61%. So there's a significant reduction 
in younger people um, thinking about driving or having that love affair with the automobile that, that certainly my generation did. Um, there's also something else going on with millennials, and it has to do with uh, where they choose to live uh, and, and owning versus renting. So I'm just going to play about a minute of this. The, the American dream was to own a home, and we're seeing the, the percentage of home ownership fall, and the millennials are going to fuel this trend even more. That millennials are, uh, their preference, 88% uh, of them say, I want to live in an urban environment. And they like urban environments where they don't have to own a car. And they're not putting all of their uh, self-orientation around their job. In fact, as boomers, we actually live to work. And that's really part of our personality. Uh, when you look at the millennials through our research and understanding them and the way they view work, they, they actually uh, work in order to live. So they want 38.5 hours a week, and that's it. So, um, and, and John goes on to talk one interesting point about younger people is having kind of come of age during this housing crash. Uh, it's really, um, I mean, we've been through some housing downturns in this country over the last 30 years, but nothing like we've seen in the last five years. So if you're a young person coming up, you may have seen your own parents have a problem with their home, with the reduced value in their home. You may know people who lost their homes through foreclosure. Um, and so those are pretty, um, that, that's in some ways maybe not as strong, but similar to what my parents' generation went through in the Depression, where they experienced all of that um, economic dislocation and poverty, and they came out of that much more frugal. Uh, and uh, they were savers um, and not big spenders. John's thesis is that with millennials, you may see a little of that impact in terms of how they look at housing, not necessarily as wedded to the idea of buying a house as quick as you can, trading up, which is, was characteristic of, of baby boomers, uh, because we always saw values rising. Um, and in fact, you could hardly go wrong if you kept buying houses over the last uh, 20 20, 25 years. So I want to show you something real quick here. This is just looking out um, at housing demand over the next 20 years. This, was, this is for the Richmond region. Um, it was a study done by uh, George Mason um, uh, University. And it looks at housing demand by uh, income category of the jobs that are being created. This study is actually underway for Hampton Roads, and it'll be, it'll be rolled out sometime early next year. But this is pretty shocking. Um, so here were existing rents in, um, the just in the Richmond region. So let's just look at rents under $875 a month. It was 41% of the units, the, the blue and the red, 41% of the units uh, under $875 a month. So if you fast forward, and you look at the future need based on the kinds of jobs that are going to be created in the Richmond region in the next 20 years, here's the amount of housing that's needed at that same rent level of 875 or under. Now it's 67%. goes from 41% to 67%. And of course, we're producing very little of this housing right now. So we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, I'm not sure what the results will be in this region, but I would not be surprised if there are some similarities here. Because one of the things that's happening is we are creating, we are not creating a lot of really high paying jobs. We're creating some, but the, there are big trends going on. A lot of service jobs are being created, a lot of healthcare related jobs, and a lot of these jobs are not high paying jobs. Those people need somewhere to live as well, and they're going to need housing that is much more affordable. Um, all right, I'm going to skip through this. We just really talked about that. Um, and I'm going to skip through this, too. This is really uh, talking about uh, sort of going back to this issue of who, who are heading households right now. Uh, if you have a single, uh, single mother heading a household, um, working, managing kids, the last thing that uh, she typically wants is a house that um, has a half acre that needs to be mowed. Every weekend, uh, gutters that need to be cleaned out, um, a home that requires a lot of upkeep and maintenance and uh, repair all the time. So John refers to that as increasing demand for what he calls self-supportive housing. That is, 
another way of saying housing that is, easy, is maintenance light or maintenance free, perhaps. Some of the problem. Um, and then, OK, so this is the big takeaway here for my comments. And, and it's what John refers to as the tailwind in the market in the next 20 years. And that is that you have these two very large consumer groups, uh, the boomers and the millennials, both coming into the market, both going to be driving the market uh, for the next 20 years. And they're both converging on the same kinds of choices uh, for different reasons, but uh, the same choices. And that is looking for housing that is quote unquote urban. And, that, and by urban, I don't mean downtown Norfolk or downtown Portsmouth, although that's true. But I think it's the better way to think of this is urban style. Um, and that is walkable, connected, smaller housing, affordable housing, green housing. Both of these population groups are looking for that kind of housing going forward. Um, and we're starting to produce that kind of housing in, in suburban areas. You know, one, of the, um, one of the great debates that's going on right now is what's, um, and there's a book I just read called End of the Suburbs. Um, and so demographers are looking at this issue. Are we, are we, have we really reached the end of suburban America? And are we never, we're not going to have any more single family homes built on half acre lots with fences and such. I, I don't believe that that's entirely the case. But I think that there are certainly trends that will dramatically slow down that kind of development that we've seen over the last 30 years. And we've already seen it. If you look at uh, growth in this country from 2000 to 2010, for the first time, what the census defines as urban areas grew faster than what the census defines as suburban areas. That's the first time that's happened. I mean, but you know, the counterweight to that is we have a lot more people living in suburbia than we have living in in cities, so suburbia is still a major driver in the market, and that's um, that's not going to change. But the kind of housing I think that people are going to be looking for in suburbia is going to change. These are the. Um, I'm going to go through one. Uh, uh, I'm going to close up now. But one last thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is what John refers to as the new frugality. And that is uh, so it's kind of what I was alluding to before about the Great Depression and the impact that that had on my parents' generation. John sees the same thing with younger people coming out of this uh, great recession that we've had. And that uh, he is, you know, he points to the fact that we've, we've um, you know, our economy is struggling nationally to recover. One of the reasons for that is we're a consumer-driven economy. We're 70% plus of our economy is consumer spending. Consumer spending has not come back in the way that we all hoped it would. And one of the reasons it has not come back, come back may be long-term. It may be a long-term impact of what people saw and the uncertainty that came out of the last five years. And that's particularly true, I think, with, with, uh, with younger people. We're all so, um, so takeaways here. Um, the urban crescent in Virginia is where most of the action will be. You're in the urban crescent. So uh, what you need to be thinking about is growth and how you accommodate growth and what growth will look like in this region. Boomers. Uh, are still going to be drivers in the housing market, even though we are, uh, we are approaching retirement. And that's because we may be shifting um, our housing status in some way, downsizing from a suburban house that we were in, or maybe getting, uh, converting a, a larger house that we're in to have an accessory unit in it. So uh, as a way to generate, um, generate more income and allow that household to stay in place, even though their income has gone down. Um, Multi-generational households are on the rise. Single-headed households on the rise. Immigrants, Virginia's going to, and minorities, Virginia is going to be majority minority state by 2040. Uh, and then finally, millennials, which are the new big force in the market, they really have a different view of housing. It's not as central as it was for my generation, and that has implications for um, the housing market in terms of what they want, uh, where they want to live, the tenure they want renting and owning. Um, and the style of house they want to live in. 
So, uh, so that's, um, that's a real quick tour through, uh, through demographics. And uh, I would encourage you all to, you can go to the Housing Virginia website. All of this, um, all these presentations are up there, including the other three on uh, economics, finance, and uh, green and sustainable. So appreciate it. And I think we're going to hold on questions until the very end. Let's give Bob a hand for that wonderful information. The only thing that was actually missing is what happens to the Gen Xers and who's going to take care of us. I mean, there's no information on Gen Xers, but, but thank you so much. We're going to take a quick, I think this is another change that we used to be a quick bathroom break for five minutes. So we're going to take a quick five minute cell phone break is what people call them these days. If you need to check your messages, um, we're going to reset and start precisely at five minutes so we can um, listen to our next two speakers with a lot of rich information regionally as it relates to some of the information that you um, um, heard as it relates to the whole state. So um, five minutes, we're going to be back on to um, continue with the program. Our next speaker is actually my colleague here at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, James Clary. And he's going to um, give um, a little bit more specific information as it relates to our region in the Hampton Roads area. Um, Mr. Clary received his undergraduate degree from Tulane University in economics, as well as degrees in mathematics and history from Leola University. He is currently um, finishing up his master's work in economics at Old Dominion University. So he's going to be on his P's and Q's because I think one of his professors are in the room. So, <laughs> so please give him, you know, really help him out here because he's, you know, on the hot seat today. Prior to joining the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission in 2007, James taught calculus, statistics, managerial economics, and he also worked as a, a strategic planner at Chartway Federal Credit Union. His primary duties here um, includes providing information and analysis on issues of regional significance, producing reports such as the Hampton Roads Data Book, the Hampton Roads Benchmarking Study, the Hampton Roads Energy Options, our Hampton Roads Regional Competitiveness Report, and the economic impact of the defense industry as it relates to our area. And also, he is the author of our Hampton Roads Quarterly Report as well. Please um, join me in welcoming my colleague here, James Clary. Okay, what I'm going to try to do is bring what was said earlier on Virginia's housing market and what's going on in the economic situation, bring it into the region and tighten it up a little bit. As you can see, we're expecting large population growth in the region. Uh, this agency produces its own population projections, which is what you see here, but there are other population projections. While we view uh, total population of reaching 2 million by 2040, the VEC numbers that were mentioned earlier only see us reaching 1.9 million by 2040. But as you look at this, you can see that Population growth varies significantly from year to year. You can see we had periods of strong population growth in the early 80s with the expansion of the defense industry. Uh, during the 90s when the national economy was booming, but we weren't growing quite so quickly, our population growth shrank. It began to grow again uh, with the war and terror and increase in defense spending at that time and has shrunk with the Great Recession. Uh, one of the keys that you should take away from this is there are a lot of factors when you're making predictions about the future that are hard to calculate. The first population projection I did, it told me all the assumptions I needed to do, and you have to assume, okay, there's not going to be a war, there's not going to be a plague, there's not going to be a natural disaster, there's not going to be Katrina. And so these are the kinds of things that you have to do when you're making predictions about the future, which is, uh, gets into Bob's comment about economists don't like to predict much more than a year into the future. Uh, as you can see, a lot of that population growth that we're expecting is going to come on the south side, uh, roughly 300,000 of it, while only 60,000 is expected to come in on the peninsula. But in that household uh, growth is going to be a little bit more because we expect household size to decrease over that time. On the south side, house, uh, households are 2.7 
persons per household right now, and we expect that to decline to 2.67 persons per household. So we're seeing smaller households as people have less children. And again, the single family aspect that we, uh, single head of household aspect that we've been seeing in some of the national data. But when you look at the demographics of our, of our households and our population in Hampton Roads, you can see that we have two peaks. And we're actually rather unique in this that the first peak that you see is actually driven heavily by our military presence and our military personnel, which is why you see the first one. And the second one is related to baby boomers. Um, as you break out the population into the male and female population, the male-dominated military becomes even more obvious in this 15 to 19, 20 to 24, and 25 to 29 year period. And when you take out this military population, we actually have a much flatter population distribution than it initially appears. Uh, moving on to the economy and to tee up the discussion about the housing market, as you can see, the Great <coughs> Recession caused a significant decline in employment in the region. Uh, the red line is the United States, the blue line is Hampton Roads, and the green line is Virginia. And as you can see, we declined about 6% of employment. That's 48,000 jobs that this region lost. And we've had significant improvement recently, but economics data, uh, we adjust it for seasonality. And uh, seasonal adjustment has been very difficult in light of the recession because you're comparing it to odd months. Just as if you were comparing month to month uh, retail sales, you might be comparing September to September. But if one of those Septembers had a hurricane, it would really throw off the retail sales for that month. Well, the recession did very similar things for our employment numbers. Uh, here we're trying to produce, predict when will we see pre-recession levels of employment again. And so we did two projections, one using the best year of growth that we've ever had, which was 1997, and then another one using average job growth. And if we have the, continue to have great growth, we expect to see recovery by May 2014, but if we have average growth, it's September 2015. And uh, as little as six months ago, this looked much worse. We've had a very strong growth it, during the summer, uh, which we're interested to see if that continues as we move into the September period. Again, these are seasonally adjusted numbers. Bring, breaking it down by industry, looking over the entire period since 2007, you can see that there's some industries that were impacted mm -hmm which were structural impacts. And so construction, obviously, the housing industry took a significant hit during the recession. There are other impacts that were what we call cyclical. So as the economy turns down, retail trade employment declined significantly. Uh, during this period, the only two industries that really showed strong growth were healthcare and social assistance, and then government forms of employment, particularly federal and state employment. But if you look over the past year, with the strong employment growth, the only thing that's seen significant declines has been federal uh, employment has been declining, which is very significant for our region. It, it's important to note as we talk about this population, the Department of Defense, we kind of expected that the industry mix would continue to look as it has, but I think we're all aware in Hampton Roads that the defense industry is under a significant amount of budget pressure. And any significant declines in the defense industry in this region would have very large impacts on both our population and our employment. So as we've talked about sequestration, we've talked about perhaps losing a carrier from our national fleet and from this area in particular. Uh, a carrier battle group has 8,500 military personnel associated with it. That's a 16,000 job impact to this region if either they lose a carrier battle group overall, or if a carrier battle group gets moved from Hampton Roads to San Diego or Jacksonville. Uh, unemployment in this region has traditionally had a very low unemployment, and the unemployment rate is actually better than it looks like here, because this doesn't include the military personnel, where we have an additional 93,000 employed people in this region. Uh, during the recession, we even outperformed the national picture because of the government industry and how it tends to not respond to the business cycle. Uh, initial unemployment claims spiked in the region with the recession. They have come down since then. And this is a factor of both 
uh, a lot of the unemployment that we're seeing now is uh, long-term unemployment as people have seen an erosion of job skills and as the economic recovery has started to take hold a little bit more strongly in this region. Uh, lastly, there are two factors that typically bring regions in the nation out of recession. One of those is retail sales, the other one is housing. Uh, Dr. Agawal is going to touch on housing in the region, but I did want to talk a little bit about retail sales. This is the national retail sale picture, and as you can see, nationally retail sales are up from where they were at the beginning of the recession. They declined significantly with the recession and then have had a strong recovery since then. But if you look at the region, you see that retail sales have not recovered to where they were before the recession. That's part of why we have 10,000 less retail trade employed in this region than we did before the recession. Another piece that has been growing has been the internet trade portion of retail sales, which of course don't drive local employment. Uh, it, it isn't actually a large portion of overall retail sales. It only represents 5% of total retail sales, but it's probably taking a significant portion out of our regional growth in retail employment. Um, I'll be ready for questions at the end, but uh, let's uh, have Dr. Agawa come on up and talk about the housing market in the region. <laughs> While James gets his presentation together, um, we want to um, welcome Dr. Agawa. We're always excited when um, we can partner with ODU and when we have him here. He um, came a couple of, uh, about two years ago when we had our ho affordable housing ride the wave and really gave us some profound information there as it relates to the housing market. Dr. Agarwal is the Director of Economic Forecasting Project and the Professor of Economics and earned his doctoral degree um, from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Um, Dr. Agarwal also, as the chairman of the Old Dominion University Economics Department from 2001 to 2006. His research interests are in the area of applied economics, but we already know that um, he's done quite a lot of work as it relates to housing, so that's why we're so glad to have him here. His articles have appeared in various um, journals such as Cor Cornell Hotel and Restaurant Quarterly, Journal of Travel Research, Economic Development and Cultural Change, and he has been cited in more than 130 different newspapers, magazines, and wire reports. So we're very excited to have him. Dr. Agawal. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. Very good. Uh, first of all, it is uh, very nice to be here in front of an audience with very much interest in housing economics. And secondly, you saw James' uh, presentation. James uh, has been one of my students. He continues to be one of my students. He should, he should have been done about a year ago, but uh, <laughs> HRPDC has kept him so busy that he either can do a good job here, a good job on his paper, so he obviously chose the former, because that pays his bills. And uh, we expect that he will be done in a month or so and get his master's degree. James, very good job. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is to give you not what the future housing market will look like, but what has been happening in Hampton Roads for the last 10 to 15 years. And where do we see the housing market going? Bob did a very good job in terms of bringing the boomers and the millennials together. Uh, he has actually given me some ideas to look forward to doing certain things for Hampton Roads market. Bob, thank you very much. So here we go. Uh, what I'm going to do is primarily focus on single family homes, not on multi-family homes. Uh, if I were to talk about multi-family homes, there'll be another hour of presentation, which I don't think you guys have time for. Uh, we'll focus on existing homes, which are roughly about 84% of the market. I will also talk about new construction homes. Here is some information on you on number of homes sold for each year beginning 2001. You notice the number of homes sold, existing homes peaked in 2005. New home construction peaked in 
2002, and percent of new construction homes peaked in 2001. New construction home sold percentages have been going down steadily, and at present they are roughly about one in seven homes. So when you see a changing housing demand structure, as Bob pointed out, it is not going to be affected by existing homes because it's a big stock. These signals are going to be shown by new construction. Uh, but please keep in mind that new construction homes represent only about one in seven homes at present. <coughs> By the way, I should inform you that most of the data which I'm presenting to you today comes from the local multiple listing service called RAIN, Real Estate Information Network. So the sales represent about 96% of all homes sold in Hampton Roads. They do not include any sales where a real estate agent is not involved. So if you're looking at for sale by owners, they're not included. But in our estimates, they represent less than 3% of all homes sold. So if you look at number of existing residential homes sold, from 2005 to 2008, there was a 39% decline. In 2009, the sales volume increased, but I believe it was only a temporary phenomena. It occurred because of first-time home buyer's tax credit. And you can see that home sales continue to decline through 2010. Good news is sales have been increasing since 2010. Actually, for 2013 year to date, sales volume is up by about 10%. So we are seeing a, a decent housing recovery. One of the points often quoted in the newspapers, okay, Shiller Home Price Index, FHFA Index, and everything else, we all focus on what is happening on what is known as the median prices of homes. So here's a brief synopsis again of the past. Median prices of home in this Hampton Roads area used to be 109,000 in 2001. They steadily increased, whopping increase in 2007, by 2007 to about 223,000. What this meant was, from 2002 to 2007, median housing price in Hampton Roads increased by a whopping 90%. It simply could not be sustained. Incomes were not rising. Mortgage rates were not falling. They were steady. Population was not increasing that rapidly. So we saw this bubble coming sometime in 2005 and 2006. Median prices declined from 2007 to 2011 by only 19%. Yes, for most real estate agents, this is not good news. For most people who bought their homes in 2006 and 2007, it is not good news, but economists would call it a correction in the housing market. 2012 was the first year after a long time, since 2007, where we saw first time an increase in home median home prices by 2.8. And year to date, 2013, median prices have continued to increase by about 4%. So good news is sales volumes are up and median prices are up. Other indicators of supply, by the way, let me also give you some other interesting phenomena about median price of homes by month. From, if you look at 2007 to about 2012, almost every month there was a slight decline in median price of homes. In 2012, in the first three months, median prices were declining, but those declines were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. For the remaining nine months of the year, in 2012, median prices were either flat or were rising. We call it a trend. This trend continues through August of 2013. So September 2013 happens to be the first month in this market since March of 2012 that we observed a decline in median price of homes. 
And I will talk about this as to why this probably occurred, and this is probably is a short-term phenomenon. Other two indicators of the housing market besides uh, the sales volumes is what is often called as days on market. The red line here tells you what is happening to days on market in the sense that how much time does it take for a house to sell. These are the lowest estimates simply because many homeowners choose to withdraw their home listing from the market and then relist it. So let me give you a story. My own house. If you look at this data set, it tells you my home sold in 64 days. Baloney. It took 11 months. I know it took 11 months. I had the house listed. It did not sell. I withdrew it. Put it back in a week's time. The new time frame starts. So these are lowest estimates, but regardless, the days on market has begun to come down. Again, this tells me that market situation is improving. The third measure we look at is estimated inventory of existing residential homes as measured by active listings. These are listings at the end of September 30th of each year. The lowest volume was in 2003. It peaked in 2009 and since that time it's been coming down and good news is in 2013, it has gone up a little bit. I call it a good news. And I'll explain to you very shortly. So currently, there are about 9,623 active listings in the market of existing homes. Peak was 13,365 in 2010. The lowest volume, as I said, was back in 2003. The reason, please make a note that in 2013, September, Inventory is slightly up, and we like it. If so, if you look at current listings by month, and you look at average sales of these homes over the last 12 months, we come up with a measure of what is often known as the estimated month of supply. What this means is, if new listings do not come in, and we keep on selling homes at the current pace, at present, it'll take about 6.3 months for the market to clear. Historical average has been about 5.6 months. So we're pretty close to the normal market conditions as far as supply is concerned. So supply has moved in the right direction. Notice it peaked way back in uh, 2010. And we're coming back to what I call as a normal housing environment a steady state environment where you don't expect housing prices to increase by double digits, which occurred between 2002 and 2007, but we don't even expect the housing prices to decline. But there's a caveat. Caveat is what is often called as distress sales. Distress sales are either represented where the banks auction your home, called REOs, banks own properties, or called short sales, where homeowner negotiates with the mortgage company and we come up with an agreement and the bank basically sells the home and I agree for those terms. Interestingly, back in 2006, and the reason we have not gone back beyond 2006, we have the numbers, because the numbers are so small, you can't even notice them. Back in 2006, distress sales were total number of distress sales of 59 out of 22,405 sales. In 2007, we actually have 1.4%. By 2011, one in three homes sold was a distressed home. Distressed homes sell for a deep discount, as I'll explain to you very shortly. The last two rows here shows you the trend for year to date September 12 and year to date September 13. Even though we still have one in four sales as being distress sales, we see a small decline in this percentage from 29 to about 26. <clears throat> Economists dig, this, dig into this data 
we're trying to find out as what in the heck is going on. So we actually have better news for you. Short sales, percentage of short sales have begun to increase. Remember, distressed sales are two components, short sales and REOs. REOs peaked back in 2011 at 26.6%, .6 where one in four homes sold was a bank-owned home. And if you notice 2012 and 13 with the asterisk, these are year-to-day September numbers. Good news again here is bank-owned sales have declined from 20.2% to about 16.6%. So two things I want to observe from this is percent of short sales has continued to increase and percent of REOs has begun to decrease. Why is this important? This tells it all. In column two, we have non-distressed sales median prices. In column four, short sale price as a percent of non-distressed price. Last one is showing you REO prices as a percent of non-distress. So notice, if the last row, the sales of REOs continue to increase, that will have a depressing effect on median prices of all homes sold. In September of 2013, distress sales what about slightly more than one in four sales, which is what brought the median prices down. Prior to that, in July and August, we saw only one in five sales was being a short sale. Whether this trend will continue or not, we'll know in about the next three days, when the October numbers come out. This gives you some distribution of what is happening to median price of homes by cities. There are only two cities where the median prices have continued to decline, called Portsmouth and Hampton. And you will see as I go on the new construction slides that Newport News joins in the freight for decline in median prices, only for new construction. But at least it's clear to us that median prices seem to be in a somewhat of a rebound except in these two cities, Portsmouth and Hampton, and I assume we have not done the analysis as yet because I don't have access to the data, that there are likely to be more of distressed sales in these two markets, proportion-wise. <clears throat> I was asked a question before this talk as to what is happening to new construction activity in this area. This chart shows you value of building permits for one unit or what often we call a single family homes. The value of these permits peaked back in 2005, about $1.3 billion. It had continued to decline steadily through 2011. 2012 was the first year when we actually saw a slight uptick in these values. And good news is this trend has reversed itself and 2013 year to date these numbers are also quite up. They're actually up by 30%. So new construction has also begun to recover. It is also clear from these numbers, for example, that, house, that uh, new construction sales began to increase in 2011 and 2012, but from the peak, they're significantly very really down still. So in terms of new construction activity, we're no way close to the 2002 levels. We declined through 2010 significantly. Steadily continue to decline. But in 2011 and 12, at least the new construction activity, the builders also tell us the market is getting better. And they're actually saying we could sell more homes except the banks are not willing to give us loans. Whether that is true or not, I do not know. But several builders have indicated that the banks have really tightened up rules and regulations on lending, and therefore, rather than giving them loans for 10 new homes, they give them for loans for two homes. When they sell those two homes, they give them for two more homes. 
So from 2002 to 2010, there's a 54% decrease in the number of new homes sold. Median prices here again, from they decreased by about 22% from 2006 to 2012. But from 2002 to 2005, median prices were increasing by double digits, by roughly about 82%. We're showing you here numbers, you know, when we talk about new construction homes and median prices of homes, I'm somewhat uncomfortable in doing so because new construction homes this year are not the same as the new construction homes that were there last year. Because builders are certainly reacting to market condition in terms of what the buyers really need or what the buyers really want. Millennials are a good example in this case. It, so new homes which are being built today are built on smaller lots. They're smaller in size, but they look bigger from inside. In other words, builders are building homes such that all the comforts are there, except they have reduced the space which used to be what is called as non-usable or not very friendly space. They're building homes which look very open, so they're making it a smaller place but a much more friendlier place. And this trend will continue to change, as I said. New construction of homes is where you will see builders reacting to changing market conditions. But here also, by the way, just, just for curiosity, uh, we saw the median price in 2011 to 12 were all over the place, going up one time, going down next month. But they also have continued shown us a steady increase in median prices for the last four months. And we hope this trend will continue. Median prices, by the way, again for new construction homes, are also up by about the same, no, existing homes are up by about 4.05%, and they're up by 4.21%. So I would say they're both up by roughly about 4%. This is the inventory of homes active listing of homes. Builders are very smart. You notice here we took a peak in the new construction inventory back in 2007. As they saw the housing market prices continue to drop, guess what they started doing? They started building fewer and fewer and fewer homes. Builders, it is their business. So if you really want to know what is happening in the housing market, we need to look at what the builders are doing. They feel it every day. A seller of a home, and I sell my home, I'm one of 600,000 people who are selling their home, right? However, builders are building very few homes. So currently, there are about 1,560 uh, 1, homes, 68 homes available for sale. High was 3570 in 2007 notice. There's still a drop of more than 50%. The reason, by the way, for 2005, 6, and 7, the substantial increase in inventory was because that was the time housing prices were increasing by double digits. They all flooded the market. They were all trying to take advantage of the market conditions at the time. Here's an interesting way of looking at how builders react to this. The blue line up there shows you what active listings were per month in 2007, for each month. The orange line is 2010 inventory. So it didn't just go, in, go down in one month, every single month. 2012 is the green line. So even though the housing market has begun to recover, builders are being very cautious. As shown by this purple line, where the active listings are still down for each, each of the first nine months of this year. As soon as we start seeing these increases in inventories, 
you'll have better confidence in the housing recovery market. Again, by looking at each city, new construction homes, please understand this again as I spell it out again and again. Houses built in 2012 are not necessarily the same as the houses built in 2013. However, you still see here a drop in median price of home in Portsmouth and Hampton, just like we saw for the existing homes. And in addition, Newport News, either they're building much smaller homes or something else is going on there. From an economist's point of view, if you look at supply and demand factors, sales are up, days on market are down, median prices are up, so therefore we should feel that housing market should recover rather quickly. But distressed sales activity is a big burden on the housing market. At present, we see a one in four homes sold as being a distressed sale. Up until the time, this proportion does not come down below 10%. The recovery in the housing market will continue to be at a very slow pace. Because distressed sales have a significant negative impact on the median price of homes sold. Here is our favorite slide. And by the way, my real estate agents love this slide. Uh, we're really talking about housing affordability. In the first column, besides the years, we show you median monthly rent for a three-bedroom house. We're not talking about new multifamily homes here. We're talking about single-family homes. And the third column, we show you principal and interest payment monthly for a median-priced existing home. You notice from 2008 to 2013, the rents have gone up, yet the monthly P&I has gone down. What does that mean? You're better off buying a home than renting a home. However, to be able to buy a home, you have to be qualified these days. Those days of what we saw, the housing prices going up in 2002 to 7 was the time when the blame actually goes on the financial institutions. They were giving all kinds of loans known as ninja loans. No job, no income loans. Those days have disappeared. If you qualify for a loan, as you can see, your P&I is much smaller than your monthly rent. And there are two reasons for this. Mortgage rates currently, even though they have increased in the last six months, they're still historically at very low levels. So one of the reasons the monthly P&I is lower is not because of any other reason except that mortgage rates are lower. And second, median prices from 2007 to present have not really gone up much. They actually have declined, which is what makes housing much more affordable and much more advantages for you to buy a home rather than to rent a home. Another way of looking at this is, this is you look at uh, housing affordability, monthly payment for a median price resale house as a percent of median household monthly income, both for the U.S. and the Hampton Roads. 2012 was the best year. It took only 17.7% .7 of a median household monthly income going towards the housing payments. In 2013, it has gone up a little bit from 17.7 to 18.3, again for two reasons. Mortgage rates have gone up a little bit, but so have the median prices. And I believe this is my last slide. I'll be available for any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. It seems as if we have had a, um, the ghost of, of 
housing past, present, and future. So we have a great um, snapshot of where we are. We want to use this opportunity now to hear from you. Any questions, comments, concerns, um, anything that anyone would like to add in? Andrew? Let me add something to what you just said. Uh, you know, it's very interesting that the housing prices continue to increase from 2002 to 2007 in this market. And millennials just don't come in and turn the switch on and switch off. One of the reasons why the newer generation is delaying buying homes is in the past, one could easily look at their face and say, housing is a very good investment. If you go back the last 40 years, housing prices have always continued to increase. Well, what happens in 2007, 8, 9, and 10? Housing prices began to fall. So housing is no longer viewed as, quote unquote, a very safe investment. 
Also, because of the bubble in housing prices, not many people are really sure whether we have reached the bottom or not. So potential buyers continue to wait for quite some time to enter the market. Many home sellers, by the way, are not able to sell their homes because, as Bob said, they're underwater. So if the housing prices begin to increase, you'll actually see an increase in, in, in listings of homes, which I view as a good sign that some people are getting out of underwater. And as those supplies begin to increase, you may also see an increase in demand for these homes. Right now, there are many individuals, for example, if you had a home foreclosed, you can qualify to get a new loan. These are the guys who are renting apartments and renting homes. But they have no other choice. So I do think that the new generation will be buying different type of homes. They may be delaying their purchases until the market settles. But I think home ownership is still going to be a dream. It still continues to be an American dream to own homes. But what kind of homes would be very different. Thank you. For it, really quick, I know this may be helpful for you as participants and also as um, for the panelists. Um, a show of hands in terms of our for-profit partners, our lenders, our realtors, if you can raise your hand if you're in the audience, real estate agents, your lenders, your realtors, um, nonprofit organizations that are working with clients, and our housing authorities and our cities that are actually doing planning and, and, and working with um, redevelopment or housing. Okay. Did I miss any other sector of people? I think we had some people from HRSD signed up, a couple of school systems signed up. Anyone else did I miss? Okay. So you see we have a very diverse group with us that, um, that this information can be utilized in different ways, even in terms of the counseling um, when a lot of the nonprofit counselors are working with clients that are in foreclosure. It's good information for us to know that when we're negotiating with um, the mortgage company that potentially a short sale um, is a much better option than the, the actual property going into a bank owned situation. So I think that would be some um, helpful information for um, our nonprofits that are actually working with clients that are facing foreclosure or still in the midst of um, working on Remod um, loan modifications and things of that nature. Any other questions for our panelists or anything that you would like to interject based on what you see in the market? Thank you, Andrew, for that question. Yeah, I'm Mr. Waller. I'm having a little trouble trying to understand what is, is driving the increase in home prices. I mean, with, with, with incomes remaining relatively flat or declining, I'm, I'm talking about real wages, uh, with unemployment, Staying relatively flat or, or some modest increases. Um, you know, lending standards have tightened up. Yeah, interest rates are low, um, lower than they've been, you know, for, for quite some time. So I'm, you know, just trying to understand, and, and maybe the lenders in the group that can answer this question what, what's driving um, the, the increase in, in housing prices, and especially given the the comments that you've made about um, um, a single family home no longer being the investment um, that, it, that it was uh, in, in the past year. Uh, I will try. Uh, this is, the, your question is actually a loaded question. First of all, let me spell this out very clearly. The median prices which I put up on the screen are not price adjusted. So let us not mix real wages and nominal wages. Uh, when the prices were rising from 2002 to 2007, if you were a potential home buyer in 2003, you said, wait a second, price I'm going to continue to increase in double digits, I'll wait next year. Well, next year they doubled again, by double digits, I mean. So you waited and you waited and you probably bought it at the high peak. But when the prices started to go down, even if you were able to qualify for a loan, even if you wanted to buy a home, you wanted to wait until the prices settled down. 
So what he saw at the end of 2011 or beginning of 2012 was when we actually started seeing a very small decreases in prices of these homes. And I would assume that individuals who were in the market at that time felt that the bottom has arrived. So those who were waiting, playing the waiting game, they had lots of options to pick houses at the time. And I think that is what actually drove the price of the market back up. But remember, we're going from low levels, very low levels in 2007 and 2008, to a very moderate price increases. But these are nominal price increases. One of the leading causes for this was demand for these homes was not low mortgage rates, all-time low mortgage rates in 2012 and early 2013. In the November and December of 2012, I believe the 30-year mortgage rate was about 3.35. Had not been that low since 1971. And the rates have just begun to increase now. I have no other explanation for you. But if you can help me, I'll appreciate it. Well, I, you know, I, I just re remember reading from several economists that are predicting another bubble. Another collapse. Mr. Uh, Schiller just made a statement yesterday. He does not see any bubble in the housing market in his, in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. And he's a much more economist, he's a Nobel laureate in economics, and I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> now, we could have bubbles in various regional markets, but see, bubbles are not likely to happen. One of the things we could do, and I don't think this is going to be a very popular comment for me to make, but I'm going to make this comment. I think we should require some minimum down payment for homes. What that should be, I do not know. But I, if you look at the homes which are sold in this area and the way they are financed, about 55% of existing homes are financed via VA or FHA loans. For VA loans, generally, we have a 0% down payment. For FHA loans, about 3 to 3.5% three down payment. Now just think about this. Suppose I buy one of these homes using a VA or FHA loan, and houses appreciate only 1% a year. When I sell my home, I'm underwater. Because closing cost, if I am able to sell my home at the same price, closing cost estimated to be close to 8 to 9%. 6% just the real estate commissions. Then you got to pay the closing cost by, for the seller, and plus you are going to prepare your house a little bit so it looks better. So if we don't require people to make housing, make some down payment on these homes, I'm not sure if you're doing a service to these people by making them homeowners. Because they're risking lots of assets. Yes, ma'am. If you, if you look at that phenomenon, <clears throat> as long as housing prices are increasing by 2 to 3% a year, there's no problem. I'm talking about the downside risk. Historically, if you look at median price of homes in the U.S., maybe you will find one or two years from 1960 to present that the median price nationwide declined. But even, even within the recession, uh -huh. the VA loans with 0% down payment have been some of the best performing loans the, and the, the smallest rate of default. So requiring a down payment of any amount doesn't guarantee a more successful loan or, or preventing, or I mean, in fact, the data within the VA subset shows just the opposite, that the good underwriting up front regardless of, of what you require in down payment, shows a better okay. going down, down the road. Got it. You must be a lender involved in these activities. Uh, I, I, I work for the Realtor Association. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. See, so, so we always, you know, uh, this is an interesting part. When you give talks to groups like you, we professors, we do our research sitting back in the office, right? When you come and talk to you guys, we actually learn something. <laughs> but what you are saying is, that we, but by the way, VA FHA loans from 2002 to 2005 
the ratio had actually declined. You want those who you could qualify for VA FHA loans in 2002, 2005, they chose to go to the conventional route because they did not have to qualify. So I think what you're really saying is qualifying standards need to be real. And you're saying if they are real, then down payment is not an issue. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Question to you. Uh, in the housing price kind of thing, uh, how big a factor in this market has investor purchases and 100% uh, kind of cash purchases in the housing price? Uh, let Did me everyone see. hear his question? Okay. Let um, me. Neil asked um, how prevalent in terms of cash sales and investor sales in terms of um, the, the data the data that um, he shared with us. Can I get my slides here? Sure. I'm going to show you this slide. I have the extra slide. I just happen to have this. <laughs> and I think... Uh, After this one? Yeah. Maybe the one. Okay. See, you knew that. This is the distribution of existing home sales by type of financing. This, this may help some of your question, your question, your question. Uh, the red line shows percent of existing homes which are financed by VA loans. Uh, the blue line shows percent of homes which are financed by FHA loans. Notice these two lines follow almost the same pattern. Uh, FHA and VA loans combined Historically, back, let's go back to 1995, at about 52% of all financing. At present, they are about the same. In between this time period, 2003 to 2008, notice percent of homes financed by VA or FHA took a dive because most people went through the conventional means. The dark line, this answers your question, this dark line, the black line, is percent of homes financed by cash. Historically, the ratio has been about 5 to 6 percent. But starting in 2007, that is when we started seeing an increase in distress sales, increase in bank account sales, and that gives an idea this ratio has now reached about 20 percent. So one in five homes sold these days is financed by cash. A cash has to be investors or flippers. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up? This has been some great questions and some great input. In the back? Can you get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes. What, what we're going to do, unless there's any objections with our speakers, we're going to go ahead and post the PowerPoint presentations from all three sessions, PDF. and I can send you a link to that you can access that. No, um, so you no can have the, the information. PDF. Um, and we'll also and include a, a link to Housing Virginia site with their other I'll information, but we'll slide. have all three of the PowerPoints available to you. So be sure if you did not register that I have your email address so I can go ahead and send that link out to you all as well. Any other final comments, questions? This has been great. Um, there are some evaluations that you picked up at the table. It would be uh, very beneficial to us if you could fill that out. If there's any other topics or any other um, sessions that you would like to see um, us bring forward for a little bit more discussion or if there are segments of the, today's information that you would like to see um, more information on, please put that down. Um, thank you all for coming. Let's give our um, presenters another hand. We wish you all a safe um, trip and your journeys and a happy Halloween. Today is National Candy Corn Day, so go out and enjoy some um, candy before tomorrow's trick-or-treaters come. Thank you for coming.